friends, in case you get a gist up from my accent. Uh, and we talked about the uh, flow control preservation in GCC for specific kind of music. So this is not going to be a super GCC technical core, as we've seen in a few. And that's very good, but this is not going to be one of these. This is more of an introduction to a fairly GCC technical project we've been working on for maybe a couple of years now, that proved very successful in use on which we have new things to do and that we love to contribute. Basically, this is about two new options, two new common line options to the system. First, two dump tables about um, information on source constructs that are relevant to certification activities when you compile code to be embedded in a certified system and how to control optimizers for this code to be um, possibly subject to non-intrusive coverage analysis and we'll be telling a lot more about that. So the general outline is to explain the motivation for this work first and then tell a bit and not so much about the implementation principles and the current status future work to come. The general motivation was the giving users the possibility to do more with GCC in the context of uh, certified projects, such as the ones that develop code that is eventually going to be embedded in aircrafts, trains, uh, nuclear plants, and so on. These software are subject to very stringent um, uh, certification processes where the developers are um, constrained to follow a number of rules and guidelines mandated by certification standards. The one I know here, bo 178 b is the one mandated by the FAA and the European counterpart for the civil avionics certification. The motivation here is to augment GCC with a couple of facilities to allow non-intrusive coverage analysis which is mandated by those standards and I will explain why it's interesting to have non-intrusive and to facilitate source to object code traceability which is a recurrent concern in those certification processes. So the first motivation really is non-intrusive coverage analysis. What do I mean by that? Users, developers of those systems have to perform coverage analysis as part of their certification activities, verification activities. And they usually do it with um, techniques that instrument the program. And it's a bit uh, annoying in some cases, in many cases actually, because of course what you <coughs> perform the analysis on is not eventually what is going to be embedded. So, and you need to rebuild the program for that and it takes time and on anything. So the idea of non-intrusive coverage analysis is to allow performing structural coverage analysis, statement coverage, that kind of thing, without having to instrument the program. How we do that? We do that by using an instrumented execution environment instead. And this execution environment is able to dump execution choices about what the program does. Or it executed this block of instructions, there was a branch at the, at the end, it fell through to the branch, that kind of information. So really the idea here is to allow performing correct analysis on GCC generated code without instrumenting, instrumenting that code relying on what we call execution traces instead to gather the relevant coverage information. So there are the three steps, the build, then the execution, the point where the instrumentation actually takes place. Is this really good? Yes. And from the execution traces, we map that back up to uh, source uh, coverage information for the certification.
The absence of proper instrumentation in the certified certification context is very useful. First, because it easily uh, allows repeating an analysis for different kinds of criteria. So if you want to look at statement coverage, for instance, or then at what we call uh, decision coverage, it's easy to repeat an analysis. You're looking at different coverage kinds kind of coverage criteria without having to rebuild the, the, the program. Of course, as I was mentioning, the analysis is on code which is much closer to what is going to be embedded eventually, if not identical. To be identical, there are efficiency concerns, which is that we need to be, I mean, for the analysis to be performed on the code that is going to be embedded at the end, we need that code to be the code subject to the analysis to be efficient enough to be uh, embeddable according to the uh, real-time constraints that we typically see in such uh, environments. So there are trade-offs to find, I'll tell you a little more about that. So that's supposed to make uh, users happy, I don't know if that guy looks happy there. He's, yes, not so much. Maybe it's, maybe it's because he's wearing a tie. I promise you don't have to wear a tie to take benefits to get out there. It's not the usual kind of developer that we use. Actually, the use of art is not very good. So, yeah, right. <laughs> Maybe too much. Uh... <coughs> so, what we have today is basically if we don't touch GCC at all, what we can get is regular kind of code generation and then execution traces extracted out of. Uh, of an instrumented environment and already with the debugging tool we have that maps instructions typically to lines we can do very useful kind of um, coverage information here it's an example of um, how we can map information about the low level machine instruction coverage up into a source particular source line with information about what all the instructions <coughs> attached to this, that source line, how they were executed or not, that was, if that was a branch where it was taken or not, and so on. That's already useful. That's already very useful. But it's not sufficient for the kind of uh, criteria that the certification authorities mandate. It's not sufficient, essentially because the kind of criteria that those authorities mandate are not at all, I mean for most of them, most of them are not at all machine code oriented. They are all source constraints oriented. Have you covered that statement? Oh, there is a weird expression controlling control flow here. Have you verified that it took that both ways? It's really not the same as looking at the very low level machine instructions. It's related, of course, but it's not the same. So the kind of criteria that we are, that those um, uh, authorities are looking at are statement coverage, what we call, I, I'm taking the um, civil, civilian agreements uh, certification kind of criteria as an example here. What they call decision coverage is you have to run tests that exercise all the Boolean expressions both ways. Every Boolean expression in your program is going to have to be evaluated true or false by, by your set of functional test, test, testing. And there are even more precise criteria that, look, that mandate looking and exercising variants of the operands within those expressions. So what the famous one is the so-called NCDC, this is modified condition decision coverage, which is basically a variant where you um, have to show that every operand in a Boolean expression may I mean has been has been shown to um, be able to um, change the general expression outcome alone. So you have to run tests that show for every operand in an expression that you can 
expose a couple of tests where just the value of the operand changes and the value of the outer expression changes as well. But just one of, of, of the operands. The detail of the criterion is not very important. It's important just to see that there are criteria that are looking down to, oh, you need to show and to look at what happens on Boolean expression operands. So that's not so difficult, but I mean that doesn't sound so difficult, but how do you do that from execution traces? That's the question that uh, we started working on a couple of years ago and for which we have devised a couple of GCC new features to that. The central idea that we are using to uh, be able to do that is to look at what branches correspond to, what machine instruction branches correspond to uh, different operands in, a, in an expression. So we look at the directions between quotes that branches take and infer the um, value, the corresponding values of the so-called decisions and the conditions, so Boolean expression and operands from there. To be able to use those low-level branches in the machine code to infer uh, high-level source-related uh, information, we need to improve the precision of a number of things in the compiler. So the first thing is, of course, we need to have a branch that corresponds to each operand in an expression. Otherwise, we have nothing to hook on to check whether the two values were taken or not. And we need precise slot information on those branches. The line number is not sufficient. Here, for instance, there is an example of a Boolean expression <coughs> with two operands. We need to find the branch that corresponds to each of the operands. And we need to determine for each of these operands whether the branch was taken or not. If we had only line info on each of on the branches, we couldn't <coughs> differentiate. And to do statement coverage in general, we need information about uh, what instruction corresponds to which statement uh, in the source. This is close to line info, but not totally precise enough. And as I will be telling more about later on, um, this is not so easy to um, ensure in presence of optimization passes. So the, one, the first new option that we developed is dash f preserve control flow. Its purpose is generally to ensure that those two blue, are they blue there? It's kind of blue. So the two bubble conditions or requirements that we have are satisfied. And then to map back information from the execution traces up into the source level <coughs> constructs, we need information about what are the relevant source level constructs we need to care about. So we call these source coverage obligations. So this is information that says, oh, at this slot spanning this range of columns, there is a statement. At this other slot, there is a Boolean expression. At this slot, there is an operand of a Boolean expression. It's useful to be able to do precise mapping and to avoid having to have having to uh, to avoid getting information on locations in the sources that don't correspond to relevant source, source constraints. The end, for instance, the the closing bracket of a function body, for instance, where the epilogue typically is attached. We don't need for certification authorities to uh, map coverage information on this. They just don't care about it. There's, there's no entity relevant to coverage that they care about at some spots um, in the function, the function declarations, for instance, or the closing brackets. And we need not to show coverage information because they don't 
want to see more than what they are still without. So source coverage obligations, these are tables describing the relevant source entities. And these are done by another new options that chef done scores. You can discuss the names, but as of today, that's the way it's done. So what we call scores is an abbreviation for source coverage obligations. These are those tables that describe the interesting source entities for coverage. Right, so this is basically about two new options, dump scores, preserve control flow, to dump on one, on, on the one hand uh, source coverage obligation tables, and on the other hand to ensure that we always have at exactly one branch corresponding to a no parent in a Boolean expression, with precise stock info, with column numbers so that we can differentiate various operators in the same expression, if they happen to be on the same line. And we need at least one instruction, one instruction slot per unit per statement to be able to map correctly that back. Actually, another um, concern in the certification area is source code and code traceability. Oh, it showed me that your compiler is not generating useless code that, um, that is not relevant to, to the application. Doing source coverage, source to object traceability analysis is not easy in presence of um, very aggressive optimizations because knowing which instruction exactly corresponds to which source and if it's really useful or not, or if, it's, if, if the, the structure of the object code really conveys the original structure of the source code is difficult at all to So having that option that controls things and um, restrict a bit optimizations, and we've built out that more is useful because it's also useful for certification because it facilitates the traceability analysis. Of course, ensuring all those constraints in presence of optimization is difficult. Having all the branches, the precise slots and so on. You know what debugging at all tools looks like? It's, it's, it's not easy. So there's a tricky balance to find between having enough optimization to have the code efficient enough to be embeddable eventually, and then not so much optimization to be able to perform coverage analysis from execution traces on the, on the executable code. So where are we today and how roughly does that work? For scores, I won't get into the details because that was not the main topic of the, the talk initially, but it turned out that developing the slides I thought could be useful to tell just, just a, a bit about it. There's a lot of information to convey about statements, about weird expressions, about their appearance, about the operators there for some kind of results uh, about dominance between uh, statements and expressions, for instance. It's sometimes useful to know that such statement is only, is only ever executed when such weird expression was evaluated to true, for instance. We need a compact representation for that. We've seen a number of talks, at, at least two, talking about reducing the amount of uh, debugging through in the execution. I mean, this info doesn't go into the executable, but it's always information on the, it's always additional information produced by the, the compiler. So the shorter it can be, the, the better, the better, the better it is for revenue. We have two implementations for that. One for the ADA, the GNAP ADA content, directly wired into the GNAP parser where we have uh, visibility on the high-level syntactic constraints. And we have an implementation for C, which is done at a much lower level, uh, just as a pre-demplification uh, pass. It's a standalone pass, pretty, pretty short, so, so uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's managed. We haven't, unfortunately, we haven't exercised the C much yet because this 
worked as initially done for uh, contracts for customers who are caring about coverage of uh, ADA coverage, essentially. But we have a couple of tests running for CFDR running well, so we know that the basic uh, circuitry is for working. Regarding trees of control flow, what implementation details can I convey uh, in, in, quick, in a short amount of time? One interesting point is that we need to look at decisions, so real expressions in general, not just those that control um, explicit control flow constructs in the, in the sources. So, uh, for instance, here there is. There is an assignment to a Boolean variable computing the conjunction of two other things. And it's just an assignment. Yet there is a Boolean expression there, and we need to be able to capture coverage for this expression for some of the coverage criteria among the authorities. And so how do we do to have branches for all those cases and to maintain them and make sure they remain in the object code in the end? We rely on the short circuit operators, short circuit semantics for that. So, um, in addition to the explicit control flow when there is. So, here we have an if statement, so there is a branch for that test. So we have a one expression with one position in there, one operand. Here we have the if statement and two operands. So we need two branches because two operands in the end. And we have one for the if and one which is actually forced by the short circuit semantics of the compass and inverse and operator. Yeah. And this one is the other example. We have an expression with two operands, so we need two branches. Normally the short circuit thing here on the force is one, but it turns out to be unified to something like that. Yeah, there is an extra explicit test which triggers the second branch, so we can map the branches on each of the operands. So we distinguish operands thanks to short circuit arguments basically, but it doesn't mean that short circuit, non short circuit operators are forbidden, they just don't count as identifying the um, operands for the coverage criteria we care about. So they are just computation computational operators. So this one here we have one short circuit operator and two operands and uh, non short circuit or, so the binary or, and here and here, are just part, and are considered as just part of the, of the operand computation, not as different things we need to look at and care about the corresponding, uh, whether, they have a, whether each of these is evaluated, is evaluated true or, or false or, or, or the case. Are you able to guarantee those short circuits? And I'm not sure if there are any GCC optimization that might attempt to short circuit even bit wise. I'm not sure what the C standard says. No, the C standard, uh, no, but uh, I'd be telling more about that. The question okay. is whether we are able to guarantee that. That's precisely the point of, what, of, of the new ocean. Okay. Not that. And it's a timely question, a useful one, because Actually, the first thing we are doing when we are going to process something for coverage analysis purposes is to reconstruct the binary control flow graph of the machine code and match that against the binary, not the binary, the control flow, flow graph expressed in the, in the source code and, and see if we can find things. So if we, if we couldn't find what we need to find, then there is a um, problem and we know about it. So that's just repeating and saying that um, basically we are doing an analysis to make sure that there is a big, good correspondence between the topology of the control flow graph in the machine code and the topology.
the topology of the control flow graph in the source, the original source. It's pretty tricky actually, it's not so easy to do because there can be um, internal branches. Of course, every operand in a Boolean expression is not always simple and sometimes there are branches for the computation of each operand and we only care about the branch that decides whether the operand as a whole was evaluated to or false. So, that's an interesting challenge here. We need to be able to sort out which branch corresponds to the operand and um, know that the other ones don't correspond to the operand as a whole but just to internal computations to, to get out of the outer value. So in this context, of course, optimization is a challenge because it's very difficult to make sure that everybody, everything fits, fits well together in the end. But we need optimization to allow the code on which we can perform the analysis to be as efficient as possible so that it can be embedded eventually. So we, do, we are working very hard at finding ways to allow as much as as much optimization as, as possible. We had the first results with GCC 4.3 for ADA only and for O0 only. So no optimization at all. Plus preserve control flow to short circuit or to disconnect a few things that still happen even at O0. We ported that to GCC 4.5, something like a year ago, or I remember correctly. Maybe, uh, maybe two years ago. And there we added support for minus 1, thanks to something I will be mentioning later on. Later on. Thanks, Alex, in advance. And we uh, implemented the uh, dump source for C at this point as well. So there are basically three, three patch sets. The first one, to, um, to go back to the, the question that that was asked is to disconnect a few of the optimization circuits that are not compatible with the need we have. So, if conversion, for instance, is a very good example, it's, uh, it's exactly contrary to what we need in the end. But what we need is we disconnect only a few of these, not, not, not so many actually. I think it's about three or four explicit passes plus a few bits here and there, for instance, in the folder to prevent uh, short circuit semantics uh, or branches that are supposed to be there but can be uh, removed in some circumstances. So we have a few. You have to send basically all the optimizations. All the? All the new optimizations. Oh, yes, that's O1 at most. Oh, oh. We'd love to be able to go O2, but we are not there yet. So the second thing is to uh, the second set of patches that we have in this implementation is the thing to keep propagating slots, 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 sorry, slots uh, across the optimization phases because we discovered that sometimes. Well, Pretty often, slots are lost in the optimization file, and so we have problems if we can't map our code to source in the end. And the third part is to have the precise, the, the necessary precision on the branch instructions, so the column, the, the, the correct column numbers. So there are two things here: adding the column numbers in the first place, and then having the branch instruction designate the operands of the expressions instead of the operators as they typically do. So there were a few challenges in the way that looks simple, well, I don't know, but maybe that looks simple to explain like that, but it took us years to get something working in the end. And one key um, point that helped us go to O1 and not remain at O0 was DTA. One of the things that happens a lot at O1 is statements or code for statements just disappearing because factorized or whatever. 
if we have no code, we have no execution choice for the statements. So uh, it's problematic. So what we did in the end was to leverage PTA to somehow associate multiple slots to a single instruction. So we know we went there means that we also went here and here and here. And that has been very useful. And we, that was a very big leap in um, results, precision, and OM when we started doing that. We have, we have tried, actually, Eric, but because we had tried a number of alternate approaches before that, and it just didn't work very well. There were always corner cases, but I know. Return statements are very fast. Because they are factorized then. The code for return, return statements is factorized then. Like every, every word. So, PTA was really great help in getting that. And it turned out that it allowed us to um, get this working with inlining as well. So, tiny functions, inline in their colors, a lot of things just optimized out because the color passes like a constant argument or something like that. We still have information that we went through the code and through the, through the code instruction first, right? At the source level, the code statement, we, we can see that we, we, we can see the coverage of both the code statement and the inline function thanks to having multiple slots associated with the inline uh, instructions and GTA. We just allow that. So, uh, that, I mean, that was really a big deal. So, we went to, oh, we don't support more than one euro, to, we support at least O1. Well, at most O1 today, and that makes a very big difference in terms of, uh, you know, maybe at O1 plus a few things disconnected, your code, your code could be efficient enough to be embedded. And, and in addition, it would be, it would be easily traceable, well, more easily traceable to, to so, so maybe now we can consider doing coverage analysis non-intrusively on the code that you are going to embed. And that's a very strong argument. So the more optimization we can get working with this technology, the stronger that, that I mean, the more situations in, uh, we, we will be allowed to uh, make that make that work. That's, that's a very strong argument. But we need other ideas. <laughs> because today we know that, well, we do one, we might disconnect a few things here and there, but we know that O1 with a few things disconnected is not efficient enough for a few cases. Um, I mean, we know of at least a few cases, a few projects, industrial projects, for which O1 with things disconnected is a yielding code which is not efficient enough to be embedded. So we'd love to be able to do better than that. We also know of cases where it's good enough, so that's a very big progress already. It's not good enough. So, two new options does cause preserve control flow to allow non intrusive coverage analysis, relying on execution choices from a uh, product style instrumented execution environment that allow uh, the use of GCC to do that kind of verification activity in very strictly, very strict uh, certification contexts. This is the base of our, today, of our um, so-called CNAP coverage product at Betacore. I'm not mentioning it to uh, advertise it, just to uh, show that it's indeed As I 
tested as well. Allowing more optimization would be great and appreciate feedback or ideas and possibilities to do that. I know Alex has some because he told me yesterday, I might, I might have ideas on how to improve that. But of course, everything else, feedback is welcome. This is it. Thank you for your attention. And you can answer questions if you like. <laughs> Thank you. 
indicates basic blocks of instructions and maps them into completely different instructions. <coughs> yes. Like so it's, 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 it's an incredibly complex transformation. Yes. Um, and <coughs> it strikes me that you, you've actually replaced a risky problem with an even riskier one. Um, but I think you, what it draws down to, for anyone who doesn't appreciate it, certification is not about higher quality code. It's about legal defensibility and liability of the writer of that code. And it's striking the fact there is no published peer review research to demonstrate that any of those processes actually lead to higher quality code, just for lower liability. Right, okay, so that's what I Yes, well, um, two things. Maybe three. <laughs> First, in many cases, we can present that in a way which is acceptable to certification authorities with the simple trick, which is to say we are just replaying functional tests with QMU and these need to provide the same results as they do when you are doing the final integration of functional tests on your board. So it doesn't prevent you, it doesn't allow you not to run the tests on the real hardware, eventually, in any case. And we say that when the coverage analysis, I mean, the, for the coverage analysis to be valid, we need the functional test to have produced the exact same results as they did on the hardware. And that is sort of bringing a bit of confidence in the fact that what was evaluated was representative of, of what is going to, of how the thing is going to run. I understand it's not a proof. It's, it's a circular argument. You're saying because test one works, test two must be correct. Because test two works, test one must be correct. You're, you're using each to validate the other. And I can't help feeling it's a logical fallacy. I, 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 I don't see that. Okay, and second, what is this about? It's not a, I mean, this is not about QU per se. Okay, so we can very well, and we are working on projects doing exactly that. Use that technology to do non-intrusive query analysis for code which is running on the hardware, for which we extract execution choices using some sort of hardware technology. Or there are variations in what we can do here. But you can extract execution choices directly from the hardware. Code. That kind of technology applies in this case. That was going to be my problem. I use the hardware text. Okay. John? Yeah. yeah. Your starting yeah. point was that you only trace locations um, of the instructions, not any data. <coughs> so that is a um, very a big disadvantage for processes to rely on predicated instructions because you can't actually use these predicated instructions to replace branches. So why do you limit yourself to only locations and not conditions that are used in predication? So you could argue if the predicate is true, you uh, execute the true path and if it's false, you execute the false path. There's no